Kia ora. Now, we mentioned in our previous video that there's a special kind of product between two vectors that actually takes in the two vectors in R3 and produces a vector that's orthogonal to them. And I didn't explain how to do it in that video and said we'd do it in this one, so here we go. Now, the, the weird thing about this product, which is called the cross product, is that it only actually works for vectors in R3. It doesn't work for any other space. Which in and of itself is not really that much of a limitation because lots of real world things occur in R3, so actually it's a very useful thing to have. So, if I think about it for a second, if I take two vectors in R3, let's just pretend that they're both aligned on the xy plane. So I've got a flat xy plane, and I'm going to put two vectors on it. And I'm trying to come up with a vector that's orthogonal to both of those. A moment's thought, and perhaps we might realize that anything that points straight up is going to be orthogonal to both of those. And we've got lots and lots of choice. It doesn't matter how tall our straight up thing is, it's still going to be orthogonal to both of those vectors. So it turns out there's extra information we can put in here. Um, the cross product actually has meaning in terms of how long it is and which direction it points, as well as just being a thing that's orthogonal to the two vectors. So we'll start off with a definition, um, a very good place to start, and then we can work from there. So here's the definition, we've got two vectors u and v in R3, then the cross product of u and v, which is written u times v, just use the cross time symbol, is defined to be u cross v is, is, is u1, u2, u3, cross v1, v2, v3, which equals u2, v3, minus u3, v2, u3, v1, minus u1, v3, u1, v2, minus u2, v1. It's a bit like the Dr. Seuss of definitions. So isn't that lovely? I don't expect it would be very easy for anyone to remember that um, without some kind of helpful mnemonic device to assist us. So we're going to use the one that Noble uses in the textbook. Um, there are other ways as well. So to help us remember this formula and actually do these calculations, we're going to use what's called the shoelace method. So you take your two vectors, write them down, the entries of them down side by side, and then continue on and write the first two entries of the vectors underneath again. So that will be u1, u2, u3, u1, u2. I've gone back to the start and done two entries. Likewise for the v's, v1, v2, v3, then v1, v2 again. Now we cross out the first line, we're going to just ignore that. And then we're going to start lacing the shoes. Um, draw a line from u2 to v3 then another one from u3 to v2 to form the first shoelace. This makes a cross, and the two pairs that are joined form the two products in that first entry of the cross product. Okay, it's u2 v3 for the first one, minus, it's always minus for the second, u3 v2. Okay, so we can continue on and make two more crosses, and they give us the other two entries of our cross product. So the second one is going to be u3 v1 minus u1 v3, and the third one will be u1 v2 minus u2 v1. So actually with a device like this, it's not so hard to actually calculate the cross product. You just gotta practice a few times and then it's not then it's relatively straightforward. So we should actually try it out and check this thing actually works. Um, so we'll start off with an example that we know the answer for. If we take vectors aligned with the x and y axes in three space, then hopefully we'll get something that points straight up when we do the cross product. So um, our vectors will be E1 is 1, 0, 0, and E2 is 0, 1, 0. Sometimes people call these vectors I and J, especially physicists, and the Z1 is K. Now let's figure out their cross product. So we'll do our shoelace method again. 1, 0, 0 cross 0, 1, 0. Off to the side we'll go 1, 0, 0. Repeat the first two entries, 1, 0, and 0, 1, 0. Repeat the first two entries, 0, 1. And that equals, I'm going to cross out the first line, first shoelace gives a 0, the second shoelace also gives 0, and then we get a 1 for the final shoelace. 1 times 1 minus 0 times 0. Okay, so it gave us the vector 0, 0, 1, which is E3, or K, if you're a physicist. So it worked. It gave us something orthogonal to both, and we know that's that's true for a fact. So let's try a little trickier one. We've got numbers in all the positions. So let's calculate 1, negative 1, 2 cross 3, 4, negative 2. And again, we'll go through the process off to one side. So it's going to be 1, negative 1, 2, 1, negative 1. And then on the right, we'll have 3, 4, negative 2, 3, 4. Cross out the first row. Now the first shoelace gives us negative 6. 
the second shoelace gives us eight, and the final shoelace gives us seven. Now this one's perhaps not quite so easy to see, if we've done it right or not, but what we can do is we can check that that vector is orthogonal with the two vectors we started with. So one, negative one, two, that's our first vector, dotted with our cross product, which is negative six, eight, seven, should give us zero, and so we get negative six minus another eight is negative 14, plus two sevens is plus 14 is zero, and for the other one, we get 3, 4, negative 2, dot uh, cross product, negative 6, 8, 7, and we get negative 18, plus 4, 8 is 32, gives us positive 14, and then minus 14, and we get 0 again. So sweet, it all works out. Now, to practice, you don't need me to set your problems, you can just generate your own, and do it as many times as you like. In fact, if, you wanna, if you're really keen and you want some practice with manipulating symbols, there are some properties of cross products that you can check just by using general vectors. So instead of putting numbers in, just use the vector u as u1, u2, u3, and v as v1, v2, v3. And you can do some things like calculate first property is that u cross v is negative v cross u. So that's interesting. With the cross product, it matters which way around we do it. If we do it the wrong way around, we'll get the negative of the answer. So this is the first time we meet a product where the order is actually really important. With all of our other products, our normal multiplication and our dot product, it hasn't mattered at all. But now it does, and this isn't going to be the first time we come across a product like this. Second, a second property to check is the orthogonality one. So the first is that the u, one of the vectors, dotted with the cross product is 0, and that the v dotted with the cross product is 0 as well. Now I'll let you plug those things in and verify that that's what we actually get. It's pretty much the only way of atta attacking that particular thing. And you can, I'll refer you to the book to look up more of those. All right, so um, now what? Well, before I move on, because we need to talk about what the cross product actually means, what the length of it means and that kind of thing, we're going to take a little diversion and we're going to look at right-handed axes and the right-hand rule. So right-handed axes, this is something you may not have met before. So a right-handed set of axes is basically a way of drawing them on a page with a consistent orientation. So essentially, when you draw some axes with x, y, and z's, what we should do is we should make sure we line our thumb of our right hand, get into focus, uh, and our index finger of our right hand. So the thumb goes with the x-axis, the index finger goes with the y-axis, and then your middle finger will point in the direction that your z-axis should point when you draw it. Okay, because when, once you've drawn your x and y, you have two choices as to which way you can make z go. The right-hand rule will tell you which way to do that. So if we draw our axes in this way, we get right-handed axes. So here are a couple of examples. First, x, y, and z. Um, so I've got x and y kind of going sideways, which means z goes upwards. Now if I drew x and y the other way around, z would have to go down. So I've tried to illustrate this with a photo of my hand, vaguely lined up with the axes, and you can kind of see that my thumb aligns with the x, index finger with the y, and then middle finger with the z. Okay, second example, um, this time I'm going to draw x and y like we normally do on 2D, and add in a z axis. Now, if I draw like this, again I'll line my x up, x and y up with the axes on the page, I don't think my hand's actually helping here much at all, um, and then the right hand rule says that my z-axis should be coming up out of the page, not down into it. Okay, so if I do the wrong one, if I do x and y and have z going the wrong way, then that would be a left-handed set of axes, not a right-handed one. Now, you might argue that it's unfair to advantage right-handers, and yeah, it probably is, but it's just a convention that everyone uses, and sadly, we are stuck with it. Okay, so why are we talking about this? Well, if we are using right-handed axes, then the cross product, the direction that your vector points, can be predicted using the same kind of rule. So again, when you've got u cross v, um, we can work out which way the cross product goes by lining up your thumb with the first vector u, lining up your index finger with the second vector v, and then your middle finger will point in the direction that the cross product will go. All right, so that gives us the orientation. The last thing we need to talk about is the length of the cross product. So what we do here is we t when we take two vectors, we've figured out which way the cross product goes. We just need to figure out how long it is. Now this one, I'm not going to prove it this time. I'm just going to state it for you. The nice thing about this is it has a very nice symmetry with the dot product. So the length of the cross product, or the norm of the cross product of two vectors, is equal to the norm of the first vector 
times the norm of the second vector times sine theta. Okay, this looks like the dot product, except we've got sine instead of cosine, where theta again is the angle between the two vectors. Usually we're working in radians. So this tells us a couple of things right off. For example, if two vectors are parallel, the angle between them will be zero, and that means sine theta will be zero and their dot product will be zero. Okay, so the nice thing about this formula is it has a really tidy relationship with triangles. So you might remember there's a formula that gives you the area of a triangle if you know two sides and the angle between uh, the two sides. And that is that the area of a triangle is one half times the length of one side times the length of the other side um, sine times sine theta. So you might, you might have this drummed into your brain as half AB sine C or something. So you, you can see this relates really nicely to the cross product. Let's take our two vectors U and V in 3D again. And we'll draw it on our parallelogram like we normally do. Then the area of the triangle, which is half the parallelogram, so let's shade it in here, is just going to be, using half AB sine C, half times the norm of U, that's the length of that side, times the norm of V, that's the length of the other side, times sine theta, which is just half the cross product of the two vectors. So the cross product is a really tidy way of finding the area of a triangle specified by vectors in 3D. Um, just calculate the cross product and calculate the norm of that and we've got the area of the triangle. You can even do this in 2D as well. Um, if we've, we've got our 2D axes and two vectors u1, u2 and v1, v2 and we want the area of the triangle, we're going to sneaky trick by introducing a z-axis and turning them into 3D vectors. Okay, And all we have to do is add a zero to the bottom of each of those and the triangle that now sits in 3D still has the same area, so it's the same thing we want to figure out. So using, so I'm going to put a zero on each one of these, uh, the area will therefore be half times the norm of u cross v, and which this example is going to be one half times the norm of u1 u2 zero cross v1 v2 zero. Let's do our shoelace method, so it's going to be u1 u2 zero, u1 u2, repeat those ones, v1 v2 zero, v1 v2, Cross out the first line, draw the three shoelaces. The first two turn out to be zero. The final one is u1 v2 minus u2 v1. And so the area is the length of that vector or the norm of that vector. It's only got one entry, so the norm of the vector is just going to be the absolute value of that last entry. So our area will be half times the absolute value of u1 v2 minus u2 v1. So it's quite nice. The area of a triangle when specified by vectors is actually very straightforward uh, to calculate using our vector uh, formula. And if an equation like that is really useful if, for example, you're doing some computer programming and you have to find the area of a triangle, which might be part of a surface perhaps. You may have seen pictures where you've got some complicated surface, but if you zoom in and say a video game, it's actually all made up of triangles. We can use formula like these to easily calculate, for example, the area of our surface by taking the area of all the triangles and adding them up. Okay, so it's enough for now. Uh, we'll see you next time. Have a good one. Kia ora.